follow me to Galilee, follow me home, when you see Galilee, then So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. לעשות את כל אשר ציוויתי אתכם. היו סמוכים ובטוחים כי אהיה איתכם עד סוף העולם. We've moved south uh, for this program from the Sea of Galilee area to the ancient city of Bethshan. This is really an old place. I, and I'm standing in a Roman uh, theater, we'd call it a stadium, I suppose, uh, which was built uh, during the Roman occupation of this land. But, but that was just a moment ago compared to the history of this uh, uh, little city. It, it's uh, got great soil and plenty of water. It's always been a fertile place where uh, people have lived and, and empires have struggled. Uh, in 6,000 years we placed the age of Bachan and uh, there were Egyptian administrative offices here when they had the territory. The tribe of Manasseh was here when uh, the chosen people came into the promised land. Manasseh had trouble defeating the militia of this city, Bachan, uh, and learned to coexist with them somehow for a couple of hundred years. Uh, King Saul's body was hung on the wall here after he consulted the witch of Endor and ended up killed in battle. And uh, then came the usual uh, rush of empires back and forth, uh, the, uh, the Assyrians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and so on and so on right up to present day, still an occupied uh, and uh, uh, fertile city. And we saw in our dramatic the two disciples reviewing in their minds. What did he say? He, just, he had just ascended to his father, and uh, they reviewed his instructions, all nations. So we came here to a Roman stadium, a Roman theater, to, which represented in the Hebrew mind the world. The empire outside of Israel seemed like to them the whole world. And so the disciples went forth with the Great Commission. And this is the true business of the church, taking out the, the word of God from Israel, or from wherever it originates and taking it where it hasn't been heard. Uh, we are harvesters. We are characterized by the Lord as workers in a field. From John 4, 35 and 36, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. The sower and the reaper, and that's us. We are the workers in a field. You hear behind me some uh, children sometimes because schools take field trips to a place like this. In Israel, when you study history, you go to the place. You don't just look at a picture in a book. So we'll, we'll hear them going. Also, archaeologists are working, and you may hear a machine start and so on because they're still digging up the past here. It's an almost never-ending task in a place as old as this. Now, when we go out as harvesters, we need to face the enemy and the world. We're also called soldiers in an army. We are intercessors for the world. Uh, intercessors are, are priests, and we are a nation of priests. From uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. This is said peculiarly of the born-again believers, the Christians 
a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, the, uh, uh, the nation of priests should look back to the original priesthood and see what their function was and what they did. Uh, the priests in the tabernacle were sacrificers, in other words, intercessors between the uh, uh, people and God. By, by officiating the sacrifice, they were taking the offering from the people and rendering it unto God. Those were the Jewish priests. Now, the church prays for every soul as intercessor. We, uh, those are the offerings in this age, the prayers. And we disciple the saved and train them for the priesthood. Uh, a good example in the gospel, and uh, uh, we showed it on our Sea of Galilee program, uh, was the miraculous catch when the Lord called Peter. He told Peter to go out in his boat into deep water, middle of the day, drop his net. Peter wasn't that confident, but he did the thing. He obeyed the Lord. There were so many fish, he had to call a second crew and a second boat out to the spot just to take in these fish, and the boats were nearly sinking. But the moment of taking out the second boat was expansion of the ministry. Peter, in a sense, was discipling those to come out and get more fish. So Peter, the great fisherman, his catch represented men. The Lord was to say, I'm going to teach you to catch men. And the second boat was expanding the ministry, discipling uh, some to help catch more fish. The priest discipled people in the temple and the tabernacle by showing them the gravity of their sins. Uh, blood offerings weren't pretty. Uh, the place, if you can picture, you walk in, there's a roaring fire. Uh, in some offerings, they give the knife to you, and you personally have to make the sacrifice. In other words, you take this little lamb, two years old, that your family had come to love, a pet, the children played with it, and you hold it in your arms, and it looks at you with those big trusting eyes, and you cut its throat. And uh, with the fire going and the smell and the person walking out, blood dripping off of his garment, he thought, said to himself, oh, all this happened because I sinned. Not that he never sinned again, but he sure understood the next time sin came up what the payment was about, and it made him think. In the church, um, if we don't disciple people, we have empty pews, and empty pews mean second deaths. Today's churches are not pretty either in that sense. Uh, if we don't have a, a full church out there, evidently we're not doing our job in the community. Uh, the, the church comparison uh, the Lord made when he came back to John at Patmos in Revelation 2 and 3 uh, he considers the churches of Laodicea versus Philadelphia in Revelation 3. The church at Laodicea uh, was lukewarm. You remember it said, it's neither cold nor hot. And since you're neither cold nor hot, I spew thee out of my mouth, the Lord said. They're liberal church, ineffective church. Doesn't matter uh, how many people sit there. No, the word of God isn't taught. No one is saved. Uh, and in contrast, the church of Philadelphia, a church of an open door. Uh, the, the church door really should open both ways. Uh, it's open for the people to come in, naturally. Everybody's church is open on Sunday. Anybody can come. Hopefully anybody can come, and you don't have to belong to some social group. But that's only one way. Very important is the church open the other way. The church members go out to the community and bring people. That is the business of the church. That is harvesting. But the way the Lord saw the world... Uh, it was divided into three major parts. Jerusalem and Judea, that's one part. Samaria, a second part. The world, uttermost part of the earth, that's the third part. In Acts 1.8, he gave those instructions to his disciples. Ye will be my disciples in Jerusalem and Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So you have three classes of the world, and it makes good sense. As we go along, we're going to show how the word always went to Jerusalem, and then Samaria, and then the rest of the world. The Lord demonstrated this himself, uh, the idea of, of the Jew first. What Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, uh, uh, the gospel has power unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Or in uh, uh, John 4.28, as the Lord told the Samaritan woman, we Jews know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, it starts at Jerusalem. And that's what the Lord demonstrated very early in his ministry. Uh, given in John 3, Nicodemus confronts him, and the Lord says, you must be born again. 
Uh, it's uh, he taught him about the spiritual life, how it is like the wind uh, that comes in lists and so on. And uh, Nicodemus' poverty was illustrated. He had little sp spiritual grasp, and uh, the Lord didn't trouble long with him, but gave him a, a remarkably powerful sermon in a few verses. In Samaria next, the Lord, in other words, started in Jerusalem, now in Samaria. He witnessed in the very next chapter, John 4, and the very, as he left Jerusalem for Galilee, he witnessed to the woman at the well. We're going to have a, uh, uh, a study on this. Uh, we we uh, did a program on it. The Lord uh, uh, does not omit apostates or blatant sinners. The woman had a head full of false doctrine because she was a Samaritan, uh, half Jewish, if that, a mixed up amalgam of Jewish theology and what the Assyrians had given to the ten tribes and brought into Israel, idol worship and so on. And she had lived the life that really was beneath that of most of us. Uh, but the Lord does not omit the apostate and, uh, nor the sinner. And finally, that's his mission in Samaria. Then he went to the world. As he traveled north in the country, the Syrophoenician woman came, the Roman officer came. Uh, these people, uh, their faith was tested, uh, and, and they passed. Uh, it, it finally is expressed in, in Acts 10, 34 to 36. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what you thought before you were saved. Uh, it doesn't matter who you were. And, and, and Israelites stood there and watched him witnessing to the Gentiles. And, and with remarkable results... And it's curious uh, uh, what he said to that Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15, Oh, woman, great is thy faith, comparing to the disciples who, who saw miracles like walking on water and, and, and big catches of fish. Oh, ye of little faith. The first case is a Gentile woman. The second are Jewish disciples who, who traveled with him and saw all these miracles. His example in the synagogue of Nazareth, he, he gave two Gentiles, in other words, still speaking from the world, uh, the widow of Sidon, uh, whom Elijah uh, uh, replenished the bread and oil for in all those years, and Naaman, the Syrian captain, who came to Elisha, dipped himself in the Jordan and was healed of his leprosy. The apostles demonstrated the same pattern. Uh, their work began in Jerusalem, uh, went on to Samaria, and then out to the greater world. Uh, the Jerusalem effort began, of course, in Acts 2 at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came, uh, the Ruach HaKodesh in Jewish terms, and came on the Jewish people. In Acts 2.5, uh, it says there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews out of every nation under heaven. And of course they came to the high festival, uh, even as they do today. Uh, they were required to. And uh, David's tomb was the theme of Peter's great sermon on that occasion, a Jewish message for a Jewish audience, uh, that David lay buried right near there. And, and David's Lord, the one he, he the, when he said in the psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110, uh, that uh, uh, this one was resurrected and was now Lord. And so 3,000 were saved. And then in Acts 3 and 4, uh, the lame man at the temple approached uh, Peter and John seeking uh, alms, and they said, Silver and gold uh, have we none, but such as we have will give unto you. And on that occasion, another a sermon based on the faith of Abraham, very inspiring, and 5,000 people were saved, and the apostles spent the night in jail. But now the total salvations in two trips to the temple was 8,000. And uh, if you count uh, those 8,000 and add in crowds from the Mount of Olives, uh, when he came, uh, the donkey ride, and they said, Hosanna, Hoshana, save us. You have thousands more. And you had a, a, a church of Jerusalem. It was the first church in the world, the first Christian church uh, in Jerusalem that was as large as the largest churches that we have in America today. And there was uh, uh, the witness to Jerusalem. It was enormous. Then uh, it, it came out further to Samaria if we look in Acts 8. It, it was then, the first was in Acts 2, and now in Acts 8. Uh, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people, with one accord, gave heed unto those things which Phyllis, Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And it says the people were healed, there was great joy in the city. And when they had testified, verse 25, and preached the word of the Lord, 
they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel then in many villages of the Samaritans. So the, the thing spread out in just the same pattern. Now it was in Samaria. And the Samaritans are, uh, well, as we described, uh, apostate in their, in their uh, uh, theology. They were uh, apostate Jews or half-Jews uh, that roughly compared to denominational liberals today. It doesn't matter if, if, if one is a Jew or if one calls himself a Christian. If his theology is liberal uh, and he's not a believer, it, it uh, means nothing in the kingdom. But uh, then as a sort of transition to the world, there was the eunuch in Gaza. Uh, Philip was commanded to go down to the south by the way of Gaza and uh, there he came to uh, this eunuch who was a, a keeper of the treasury for Candace, queen of Ethiopia, uh, evidently like an office of management and budget, and uh, a controller, and he was uh, on his way. Uh, he, he went to the feast at Jerusalem. He, he, he was Jewish, and he kept the Jewish faith. He was reading Isaiah 53, and when Philip uh, joined him and talked with him, uh, he asked, of whom does the prophet speak? Because he concluded that Isaiah 53, uh, by his stripes are we healed and so on, was messianic. It, it definitely was about Messiah. And Philip witnessed to him from Isaiah 53 and uh, explained, this is, uh, this is the one of whom I'm telling you. And, uh, uh, he, of course, he was saved. Uh, Philip stopped at uh, Caesarea, uh, verse 40, a Gentile city. It's, in other words, branching out now to the world. Uh, Saul of Tarsus is saved in the next chapter, the, the great witness to the Gentiles of Jewish faith and faith in Messiah. And so it's out in the world. Uh, when Peter goes to Cornelius in Acts 10, and he comes in to him, and uh, Cornelius bows down to him. Cornelius, of course, it, it says he gave alms and he prayed to God always. Cornelius deeply appreciated Judaism and might have been as... as uh, uh, we mentioned in, in one of the programs, a gir hatzedek, uh, a righteous uh, uh, proselyte. Uh, uh, he would rather have been Jewish uh, than be the pagan that, that his other officers were. Uh, he, uh, he sought of, of the higher thing. But when Peter came to him, he heard for the first time of Messiah. And uh, uh, the, even the, the uh, Jewish Christians that came with Peter were astonished that on these Gentiles, uh, came salvation unto life in Acts 2, 44 to 47. They were astonished because they just had not seen wholesale Gentile salvation like this ever before. Because now, just then, the Word is coming out to the world. In the Gospels, the uh, people of the world had come to Jesus. But in, uh, uh, in the uh, book of Acts and uh, in the apostolic period, they went out to the world according to his directions, Jerusalem, Samaria, the world. Now, Acts 11:18 is a proof text that God wants this done, uh, Gentile salvation. Uh, then hath God uh, given uh, repentance unto life to the Gentiles also. So then it was out into the world all the time. The gospel went to the empire, still with the principle Jews first, uh, as it says in, in Romans 1:16. Uh, Paul went uh, to, the, uh, to Asia, to Greece, and he spoke in synagogues. Uh, he was invited to speak as, as a, uh, a rabbi, a, a graduate of the academy at Antioch, a, a person who spoke fluent Greek, and uh, who also could teach uh, uh, the interesting lore of the Jews, the, the, uh, the Bible. It was the Old Testament, but he lectured from it, skillfully proved Messiah from it. And uh, in fact, so many Gentiles were saved. Paul began to write things like uh, Romans 10.1, uh, uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Or Romans 11, 1, I myself uh, am an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, try, trying to impress them that uh, uh, while, while the message was running like wildfire through the empire and Romans and Greeks and so on were saved, uh, what about the originals? He thought they were already making an omission in the Jewish witness, and that omission goes on to the present day. He was exactly right. Now, what is today's uh, uh, witness from the church to the Jews? Uh, <laughs> greater in one area than another. Uh, there is great revival among Jewish people, but this is a rather difficult witness, and some in the church really don't like undertaking it, if the truth be told. It's a difficult witness because uh, there's no sin nature in, in Jewish theology, so first of all, uh, the basic reason for salvation really isn't there. 
and then a worldly view, uh, legalism, uh, ritual worship, uh, which, which was the complaint in, in Herod's time and before, that the temple had deteriorated to mere ceremony. Uh, they weren't sincere. But, you know, when God chooses who will take out the word, he invariably chooses from his chosen people. In uh, Genesis 11, when the Tower of Babel was built, the next thing you read about in the next chapter is Abraham, who he calls. Uh, in that case, he invented them, <laughs> uh, one chosen people to work through. Uh, the disciples were all Jewish, uh, all Jewish disciples, all Jewish apostles, and the 144,000 coming in Revelation 7-4 are all Jews. I, I said it once on my call-in radio program, and uh, somebody called in from one of the cults and said, but we're the 144,000. Why do you say it's 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel? And he, he had me shaking my head for a minute. I said, I didn't say that. God said that. I'm just quoting that. And I showed it to him in the Word. Uh, the Samaritans of today, we have them still. The Samaritans are the liberal and sacramental, quote, Christians. Uh, church going and, and sincere at least to, in the case of observation of, of religion. They are observant, but, uh, but uh, no salvation there. Difficult witness also. And maybe the non-observant Jews are the same group. Uh, uh, just a spread of people with the knowledge of God, but, but uh, not, not much faith to match. And the world today, of course, is, is <laughs> gone to hell in a handbasket. What can I say? Uh, sin. Uh, uh, rampant everywhere uh, unto death and uh, uh, the world is a real tough witness these days but we need to do it we need to send missions that's the uh, end of the age as, as Jesus said Matthew 24 14 uh, and this gospel will be preached in all nations and then the end shall come the Great Commission climax is the age of grace and it heralds the day of the Lord the the end of all things the the rapture tribulation uh, uh, Antichrist, uh, Armageddon, and end. Uh, have we uh, uh, been to all nations? Not really. Wycliffe has translated the Bible into 2,000 languages. There's 5,000 being spoken in the world. The bad news is. So, let's review the Great Commission to number one, the Jew. Number two, the Samaritan. Number three, the world. In other words, number one, the religious. Number two, the liberal. Number three, the secular. If we do nothing in this life, but bring a single soul to salvation, it will make an eternal difference. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. That was the whole song, All Power in Heaven and Earth, uh, composed, of course, uh, word for word, the Great Commission. It was some story, that song. It was one of those where it came so fast to me that I couldn't write it down fast enough. And I uh, read the words. It's not a poem. Of course, it's not a psalm. It's a declaration by the Lord. All power on heaven and earth is given unto me. Uh, teach all nations, so on. Uh, he just says it, and it's not necessarily easy to set to music. And yet, the music that came to me, and, and all in a rush, faster than I could write it down. Honestly, if I were a stenographer, I would have told the boss, don't dictate that fast, I'm not going to get it. 
I was <laughs> at the piano and trying to write and trying to play and getting ideas. And when it, when it was set down, it, syllable for syllable, the King James words fit the tune that I had, the melody. Uh, this is so rare. Those of you who do music, compose it or play guitar or whatever, know that, that uh, because you can pick a tune doesn't mean some set of words is going to fit. And even more rare that, that archaic words are going to fit. And still more rare than that, archaic words that were spoken in a short speech, not a poem, something like that. But the whole song, apart from the labor of writing it, not even 10 minutes, maybe five minutes. And it's happened before, and uh, I can only tell you, I feel like just someone who uh, is a conduit from, from where the stuff really comes. Uh, I, I, I write it, uh, Rob and our musicians and singers and so on, uh, are the packagers, and we get it to you from uh, someone who wants you to hear it. What can I say about the Great Commission? Witness is the second work. The first work is to love the Lord. This is what we do. Television is the prime way to get to the remote parts of the earth. Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.